The Miami Hurricanes just wrapped up their sixth practice of fall camp. And I like something that I saw today from the quarterbacks and the receivers. You are Locked on Canes, your daily podcast on the Miami Hurricanes. Part of the Locked on Podcast Network, your team every day. I am Alex Dono, University of Miami alumnus, longtime South Florida sports radio vet and contributor to allhurricanes.com. And thank you so much for making Locked on Canes your first listen. The everydayers out there, we absolutely love you guys. And today's episode is brought to you by LinkedIn. These days, every new potential hire can feel like a high stakes wager for your small business. That's why LinkedIn Jobs helps you find the right people for your team faster and for free. Post your job for free at linkedin.com slash locked on college terms and conditions apply. So on this Tuesday practice, shoulder pads were on shells, not full pads today. We'll see if they're in full pads tomorrow, but I can guarantee you on Saturday at Canes Fest, 9 a.m. at Hard Rock Stadium, open to the public. So come and see us out there Saturday at Canes Fest, which will be the first scrimmage of fall camp. Full pads will be on. OK, but. On this Tuesday, and let me remind you, media are only permitted to watch about the first 30, 35 minutes of practice. A lot of that is stretching, some individual drills. We do get to watch some passing drills. And I thought today was a sharp day, the sharpest that I've seen yet for the quarterbacks and the wide receivers and the combinations there. Remember, we talked about what Shannon Dawson said over the weekend. Miami's offensive coordinator said that, you know, they're still working on the timing and getting in sync between the quarterbacks and the wideouts. Uh, it looks like they're getting there. OK, you did see a few drops today, but, you know, not as bad as what we saw last year in fall camp. For example, you remember last year, last year, all we could talk about is nobody's catching anything in fall camp. Uh, I thought they looked pretty good today. A few drops here and there, but I thought the timing looked on point between the quarterbacks and receivers. It looked better than it did last Friday. You remember coming out of last Friday, like there was a moment where, you know, a couple quarterbacks and drills, uh, you know, missed some throws and Dawson was getting a little animated. He's also the quarterbacks coach. I didn't see anything like that today. The drills were running smoothly. I did take a closer look today at Tyler Van Dyke than I did last time out. I thought TVD today had especially good command of his deep passes. Saw him hit Jacoby George. Colby Young deep. He hit Xavier Restrepo a lot, was hitting him in stride. So I thought today was a really sharp day for Tyler Van Dyke. You're right. You know, um, he's always been at least, well, always like the last week, he's been you know, the most consistent out of the three scholarship quarterbacks. That shouldn't surprise you. But I, I thought today was a really, really sharp day going downfield for Tyler Van Dyke. On the wide receivers, I just want to make something abundantly clear with what we're able to observe out there during these practices, because I've gotten a few questions. I got one today about Shamar Kirk and how he's doing the transfer who we really love from Reedley College, because somebody noticed I haven't talked a whole lot about Shamar Kirk. Is there a reason why do I not like what he's doing out there? Um, he's looking fine to me, but here's the thing with the drills that we're watching out there. OK, and with what's not happening, they're not in full pads. They're not full tackling. Uh, and that takes away what really makes Shamar Kirk stand out. So I think we're going to get a much better look at Shamar Kirk this coming Saturday because his biggest strength, his superpower is his yards after catch and yards after contact. Since we're not seeing yak situations and we're not seeing contact in practice, that's one of the reasons why I haven't been, you know, shouting from the mountaintop, Shamar Kirk looks amazing because we haven't really seen those situations yet where he really thrives. So, uh, you know, there, there's no reason to be concerned. I think Shamar Kirk is looking fine. In fact, it looked like he was pretty high up in the uh, in the rotation today, getting a significant number of reps. So uh, the coaches like what he's doing out there. And I've got a feeling Canes Fest, we might see a few plays where Kirk has a chance to get some yards after catch, break a couple of tackles, and really show us what he can do. Uh, but going back to the quarterbacks for a second, I continue to see Jakari Brown looking better and better with his throwing accuracy, right? Um, so I'm looking forward to watching Jakari in 11 on 11s, but just watching him in drills, no pass rush, anything like that, 
Um, he's always had the strong arm. And these last couple of practices, I thought Jakari has looked pretty darn accurate out there. So, you know, how how much he's improved his throwing accuracy from last year to now, it's very noticeable, okay? So he's been looking really good. We saw some wide receiver and tight end blocking drills today. So that was Cam McCormick's time to shine. Cam McCormick is like a kid in a candy store when you add blocking into the equation. He's the best blocking tight end on the team. And, uh, you know, he, he was looking good in those drills today. Um, you know, we, we talked uh, yesterday about Tyler Harrell. He was out there fully participating with the team. You know, there were some, some rumors and stuff about his health late in the week. I am confident, confidently telling you he is totally fine, and Tyler Harrell is going to be a weapon on this defense next year. You know, I did at one point, I got out my binoculars to look at the offensive line. Jalen Rivers is a physical specimen, right? What is he now, a fifth-year junior? The whole COVID extra year throws me off. I think he's a fifth-year junior. Um, so I commend Jalen Rivers on how he has been able to lean down and tone up his body even more than last year. There is not an ounce of body fat on that dude. He told us last week he's weighing around 330 pounds uh, these days. Now, going over to the defense, uh, I know that I've harped on this a lot over the last week, so I'm going to sound like a broken record, but I am very cautiously optimistic about the cornerback room. I think the cornerback room is going to go from being kind of a liability last year. That might have had a lot to do with the scheme, but it's going to go from being kind of a liability last year to probably being a strength this year, especially when I look at the physical makeup of guys like Devontae Brown, Damari Brown, Jadeus Richard, who all look massive for corners at six foot two. So it's important to have long corners, I think, anywhere in the country, but especially in the ACC. When you go up against a lot of pass-heavy teams and when you have tall wideouts that you're covering, guys like Johnny Wilson at Florida State, who's six foot seven, it's important to have the longest possible cornerbacks in this conference. So I think at corner, there's definitely going to be a lot of competition for for uh, for the two starting boundary spots, right? In the at the nickel, you know, it's basically going to be uh, Jaden Davis versus to Corey Couch, but at the boundary. Um, you know, when you've got guys like Daryl Porter and Judeus Richard, Damari Brown, Devontae Brown, all competing for two spots, I think you're going to get some heated competitions there. And it would not surprise me, and it'd be really cool if it plays out this way, if you end up having Devontae Brown and his younger brother, Damari Brown, both in the same starting lineup. If if Judeus doesn't have something to say about that, because he's looked really good as well. Uh, so when we come back, Really, really important takeaways and clarification from Miami's veteran linebackers, because we spoke to four of them today. They talked about Miami's run defense on Saturday, which the defensive coordinator told us didn't have a good day on Saturday. Have they improved that? How is the linebacker room gelling? And how are the young guys adapting? You got four true freshmen in that linebacker room. How are they doing? We'll talk about that and more when we come back. You want to keep it locked right here. We're only getting started on Locked on Canes. I'm only getting started on LinkedIn Jobs. These days, every new potential hire can feel like a high-stakes wager for your small business. You want to be 100% certain you have access to the best qualified candidates available. That's why you have to check out LinkedIn Jobs. LinkedIn Jobs helps you find the right people for your team faster and for free. I've been on the other side of it, folks. I have found jobs. I have found employers through LinkedIn Jobs before. It works. You add your job and the purple hashtag hiring frame to your LinkedIn profile to spread the word that you're hiring. Then simple tools like screening questions make it easy to focus on candidates with just the right skills and experience so then you can quickly prioritize who you'd like to interview and hire. It's why small businesses rate LinkedIn Jobs number one in delivering quality hires versus leading competitors. LinkedIn Jobs helps you find the qualified candidates you want to talk to faster. Post your job for free at linkedin.com slash locked on college. That's linkedin.com slash locked on college to post your job for free. Terms and conditions apply. Thank you so much for making Locked on Canes your first listen today. And for the everydayers, if you want to take your everydayer experience to the next level, sign up for our exclusive SMS texting service through subtext. I include a link in the show description below. So you get text messages from my phone directly to yours. You could try it free for 14 days and then $4.99 a month if you want to opt in after two weeks. 
We give you a lot of added value on there. I was sending out like a dozen practice updates from this morning, was keeping you guys updated on what the linebackers were saying. We'll talk about that in a second. Give you guys recruiting scoops on there, breaking news, show previews before anyone else gets them. Sign up for our exclusive subtext with the link in the show description below. All right. We had the privilege today after practice of speaking with Four of Miami's veteran linebackers didn't speak to, to any of the freshmen just yet. That time will come again. I spoke to some of them over media day, but we spoke today with Corey Flagg, KJ Cloyd, who just transferred in from Louisville, Wes Besaint heading into his second year, and Kiko Mauinoa, who just transferred over from Washington State. All of them, to a man, really enjoy how unpredictable Lance Guidry's defense is. Sounds like it's a really fun defense to play in. I think it was Wes Besaint who told us flat out, I like this defense a lot better than last year. It's like he told us flat, like this defense really kind of fits him and, you know, fits the way that he wants to play. Um, and so the emphasis there on the unpredictability is opposing players are just not going to know when or where you're coming from. Okay. Um, here was something that really stood out to me. Uh, Corey Flagg and Kiko Maui Noah. They gave us some great insight on the benefits of just having more competition in that linebacker room. Now, obviously, for Kiko, it's his first, uh, you know, first uh, few months in Miami. Flag has been here for years, but when it when it, when it comes to making that linebacker room deeper, which is what Miami's done, it's not just about the competition; it's also about the collaboration. I thought this was a great point. Corey Flag first brought this up. I hadn't even thought about this. So Flag told us a story about how he and Kiko will kind of watch each other's technique and give each other tips, right? So there was something Flag said when he drops back into coverage that uh, Maui Noah pointed out to him, you drift a little bit too much. And then after having that pointed out by a teammate, he was able to address that and kind of tighten up that part of his technique and that Flag had given Maui Noah some similar advice and tips on on something that was, you know, maybe just a little bit a little bit off on his technique that needed tweaking. So it's pretty cool because um, you know, your actual coaches can only do so much, right? If you've got veterans on the team that can actually collaborate and coach each other, that's one of the benefits to having more depth in the linebacker room and to bring in experienced guys because Maui Noah is experienced, KJ Cloyd is is very experienced, is in his final year of eligibility. Um, and so, you know, it seems like, um, all of the veterans who we spoke to today are really helping the young guys adapt, right? You've got four true freshmen in Popo Aguirre, um, Marcellus Pulliam, Malik Bryant, and Bobby Washington, that the veterans, especially a guy like Corey Flagg, who's a film junkie, are setting a good example for the freshmen on how to prepare and how to conduct yourself, um, and, you know, when I've been watching the linebackers in practice so far, K.J. Cloyd, who we spoke to today, he's someone who really stands out because of his size and his quickness. And he told us that his best attributes in his mind are that he's experienced and that he can run. That's the way he said it. He can run. And so K.J. said, you know, the biggest differences between Miami, where he is now, and Louisville, where he came from, first thing he brought up were the temperatures. He's feeling that heat and humidity. He says it never gets that hot in Louisville. But, you know, he also talked about the cultural differences. Like he, he said that Miami coaches really go out of their way to make the players feel like family. He says it's more of like a family or it wasn't throwing any shade at Louisville. I don't want anyone to interpret it that way. But he went out of his way to really praise the, the family atmosphere that Miami coaches create down here. I thought that was cool. And yes, Cloyd. He said he's really impressed that Miami's four true freshman linebackers, that all of them, they work really hard to learn the playbook and the scheme. That's not always something that's easy for true freshmen, especially a scheme like Guidry's, who Guidry admits it's pretty complicated for the young guys to learn. Now, Cloyd, Cloyd admitted to us that when he was a freshman at Louisville, you know, he mostly just ran around and tried to make plays. He didn't have the best grasp of the scheme, so he noticed that Miami's young guys are really going out of their way which is nice to hear. And that was always something that was told to me about Miami's true freshman class, not just the linebackers, but that all of them, they love football and they have a great attitude about wanting to learn. So it sounds like Miami's new linebackers fit that mold really well. 
you know, we asked all four of the veterans that we spoke to, which of the freshmen have stood out most, right? And all of them, all of the veterans went out of their way to sing the praises of Popo Aguirre. Flag said that Popo has really started to grasp that scheme over the past couple of practices, that it's really clicking for him now. And then the others that we spoke to, the other veterans, all said that Popo has really been making big plays in practice these last couple of days. So it sounds like he has hit the ground running. Uh, Wesley Besaint, who we spoke to, I think he's really helping the freshmen because he reminded us he was in their exact position last year. Like one year ago, he was a true freshman getting a crash course. Uh, he told us that it was kind of late in his freshman year. You remember he started the last handful of games and played great. He said it was at that point when he began to when he became a starter, that's when the game started to slow down for him and that it's kind of been that way ever since. Corey Flagg told us uh, just about his health, which I think is an important note. He feels so much better out there now that his foot is healed. He had a foot injury during spring football. He said it really affected his tackling, but now he's feeling comfortable out there. He's able to tackle properly, you know, for whatever limited tackling they're doing. If, if I'm being honest here, they're not doing full co contact. But Lance Gidry did also tell us on Saturday that Corey Flagg is the most improved player on the defense from spring to fall. So it sounds like Flagg's health and dealing with the foot was one of those things that was holding him back during spring football. So really good stuff from the linebackers today. When we come back, what is the ACC doing exactly? Is there really mutual interest, mutual? Is it mutual between Cal and Stanford and the ACC? Or is that interest really just one-sided? Would the ACC really add Cal and Stanford? We will talk about that next right here on Locked on Canes. Thank you so much for making Locked on Canes your first listen today. For the everydayers, we're going to talk with Brian Smith, talk some recruiting on tomorrow's episode. We're going to talk with Larry Bluestein on Thursday. We're going to talk with the truth teller, Bruce Warner, on Friday. It's going to be a loaded rest of the week. It's only Tuesday, but it's going to be a loaded rest of the week here on Locked on Canes, available free wherever you get your podcasts and available free on YouTube. So, uh, I was reading the latest, and this story seems to get updated every couple of hours anytime there's new information, but Dennis Dodd at CBSSports.com, he's been on that conference realignment beat, okay? And he writes at CBS, Cal and Stanford have shown interest in joining the ACC. What's not known is whether the interest is being reciprocated by the conference, uh, ACC athletic directors, he said, were scheduled to meet to discuss the school's viability on a Monday call. That was yesterday. Don't know. I'm, I'm assuming that meeting happened. Uh, he says ACC presidents meet later this week on the subject. It's not clear whether either meeting includes exclusive discussion of expansion. The talks are considered preliminary at this time. But as we've seen over the last couple of years, realignment can accelerate quickly. Furthermore, he says the University of California Board of Regents has a scheduled meeting at 10 a.m. Eastern time on Tuesday to discuss its Pac-12 membership. And I, I've heard that Stanford, um, who is one of the teams, one of the schools being talked about here about possibly joining the ACC, is also thinking about going independent, thinking about going the Notre Dame route. OK, so, yeah, with the Big Ten snatching up a bunch of new schools and raiding the Pac-12 and the Big 12 raiding the Pac. What is it now? A Pac-4? Are there four schools left to the Pac? If I'm the ACC, the possibility of adding Cal and Stanford is a catastrophically bad idea. Dumb. Pointless. The only things that Cal and Stanford would add as members of the ACC are they might bump your academic prestige, okay? Because obviously Stanford, Stanford is known as being the uh, the most esteemed academic institution in all of the Power Five, or maybe even in all of FBS, if I'm being honest here. And you know, Cal Cal has uh, lofty uh, lofty academic reputations as well. But in everything else, I don't know what this does for you. Let's start with geography, okay? I get it. If you're going to expand out west the way the Big Ten has done, um, you know, there are advantages in trying to expand your reach to another part of the country. Let's capture another coast. But OK, 
when you're capturing the left coast with powerhouse programs like USC and, you know, to a lesser extent, UCLA. And, you know, in the Big Ten's case, adding Oregon and Washington, who I would have loved to have had them in the ACC. That makes sense. Folks, there's a reason why all of this pillaging and plundering that the Big 12 and the Big Ten have done just eating the Pac-12 apart, there's a reason why they never went after Cal and Stanford. (laughs) Because they don't move the needle that way. They don't. Even I was reading in the Dodd article. Now, I'm not an expert on TV markets out West. I know, obviously, Los Angeles is a big, desirable market. But according to the Dodd article, there's kind of a consensus out there that the Bay Area market, which is the one that encompasses Cal and Stanford, is considered to be an overrated television market. I'm not sure what maybe all the uh, all, all the other uh, people out there they don't watch TV. Maybe they're just busy working at their software companies or whatever they do over there. But apparently, it's considered to be an overrated television market. And again, those are not athletic programs that really move the needle when it comes to football TV ratings. Anyway, when you're talking about Cal and Stanford, so for those schools, I could understand the benefit of trying to join the ACC. Because they're hanging in the wind right now. You know, the Pac-12 is is dead. So, you know, they're looking for a home, right, anywhere. I, I don't care if it's on the other side of America. They're looking for a home right now. I can see how it would benefit Cal and Stanford to join the ACC. But how does it benefit the ACC exactly? So you're creating a logistical travel nightmare when you're talking about teams from North Carolina and Virginia South Carolina and Florida and Syracuse, New York, talking about having to travel over to the Bay Area, you know, frequently. And those teams having to travel all the way out east multiple times per year. And it's not just football we're talking about, folks. You also have to remember basketball and baseball and tennis and women's golf and swimming and diving, because this isn't just I know football is the one that makes most of the money, but it's not just about football when you think about logistical nightmares. And then when you're talking about adding two new programs to your conference that I don't believe move the needle, then doesn't that just make the piece of the revenue pie smaller for all the other teams in your conference? So if you're thinking about redistributing the revenue to add two more teams, they better be two more schools that are going to carry your weight and bring up your average uh, yearly revenue, right? To bring your TV deal up. Like I, I, I don't think adding Cal and Stanford is going to give the ACC the ammunition to say, okay, ESPN, now we've got Stanford and we got Cal. We need to renegotiate our deal. You need to pay us more. I don't think it helps your bargaining power. I mean, if you had added War Oregon and Washington, yes, that could have increased your bargaining power. Cal and Stanford, I don't believe, put you in a better position to get any more revenue. So we'll see what happens. But this one doesn't make any sense to me. Right. The cost and the logistics of having to travel back and forth Bay Area to the East Coast. What would you call the conference? It can't be the Atlantic Coast Conference. What the just the coastal conference either side, which uh, you take your pick Atlantic Pacific. This one doesn't make sense to me, folks. There's a reason why Big 12, Big 10. They didn't want Cal and Stanford. They left them behind. I don't see why the ACC needs to go out of their way to bring them in. Conference realignment makes me very, very worried that Miami is going to be left in the dust in a dying ACC. But if they were to add these teams, dying, desperation move, this doesn't do it for me. I'm Alex Dono. We will talk to you guys again next time on another episode of Locked on Canes, part of the awesome Locked on Podcast Network, your team every day.